Buongiorno, il mio nome è Enrico Bossani, io sono il direttore editoriale di Colors, alla mia sinistra è Patrick Waterhouse, è il direttore artistico di Colors, alla mia destra è Jonathan. Ho chiamato Jonathan qui in un minuto perché abbiamo, oltre alla lecture di Patrick, in, nel corso abbiamo un negozio arredato con una macchina, con la Color Machine, e la Color Machine è una macchina in grado di ricevere i vostri Twitter e di trasformare i vostri Twitter, come quello che questa mattina ho fatto io, baci da Perugia, in peru.com. Allora, invito tutti ad andare a vedere che cos'è questa strana macchina che reinventa i vostri... I vostri Twitter e li trasforma in un'interpretazione che solamente John. You want to explain just one second what is the machine? Sure. I'm not sure what uh, Enrico said quite, but um, basically the machine came about as a response to Colors 86 making the news and sort of an interactive reflection of what that magazine is about. And sort of the machine basically tries to emulate the process of how news is degraded as it transforms and is transmitted through different media. So you send a tweet to Twitter at Colors Machine, it gets spoken out, it gets listened to, reinterpreted back into text, displayed on a screen, read by a camera, spoken again, reinterpreted back into text, and by the end of that you have something completely different but with echoes of the original tweet. So you sort of have this, uh, what do you call those machines? Those kinetic machines, it's sort of a the data sort of flows from one to one to one to one and gets distorted in the process. So come see it after. Okay, Patrick è arrivato a Fabrica, che è il centro di comunicazione della Benetton. Colos è il progetto più importante in questo momento che Fabrica sta realizzando. È arrivato da noi come, uno, come studente nel 2006, fine del 2006. Dal 2007 collabora con noi ed è il direttore artistico e lascio a Patrick di spiegarci che cos'è l'ultimo numero, fare notizia. Grazie Patrick. Ok. So, hello everybody. I'm going to talk about uh, four things today. I'm going to very briefly um, show you some things I've done before Colors. I'm going to give a very short history of Colors. Then I'm going to take you through some of the recent issues that I've been making, focusing on the most recent, which is about news, and then talk a bit about my approach. So, this is a drawing of my life. And you can see where I was born in 1981. And um, when I moved to London, here's where I moved to Italy, to Fabrica, where Colors is made. I actually left for a time and lived in South Africa, and then I returned in 2011 to take over as editor-in-chief. Um, so first, I'm just going to show you some past work. Um, this is a project about a building in Johannesburg called Ponty City. And it used to be the largest residential building in the Southern Hemisphere. And in 1976, it was a whites-only building. It was very aspirational. Um, and after the end of apartheid, there was an exodus from the city itself. And it became seen as a symbol for everything that was wrong with the city. It got known for being squatted. And there was lots of mythology around it being run by Nigerian drug lords. And... Um, Myself and the, um, my partner who I work with, a guy called Mikhail Sabotsky, we spent a long time in the building. We've been there like, working on this project for the last five years and looking at the space and how people interact with it and also using it as a, uh, an example of a problem which is much wider within the city and how kind of migration to Johannesburg works. And one of the things we did is take a picture out of every window of the building And it was a very time-consuming task because obviously we needed to get access to all the rooms and explain to people what was happening. Um, but you get this internal view of the building and also this external one. And you kind of get a map of the spatial relationship between where people are in the space. We also did every door and every television as well. There's also a large... Um, There's a, a more classic reportage element, sorry, and an archival element. This is the original uh, marketing material from uh, 1976. 
and um, this is, there's also a lot of found material as well. I, this is another project, very different. It was a book, um, an illustrated version of Dante's Inferno. It was a commission from the publisher Mondadori. Um, and I decided to uh, imagine that there was a natural historian accompanying Dante um, through hell. So really imagining um, the Inferno as a real place and trying to deconstruct the different characters, like imagining the, well, actually explaining the family tree behind different characters and looking at the flora and fauna and actually kind of making it tangible and deconstructing tan cantos in kind of an anatomical fashion. I also like to do books. I actually did this book uh, with a photographer who's at Colours called James Mollison. It's about children and their bedrooms. It looks at different situations children find themselves in by the use of bedrooms. And when it came to doing the cover, I wanted to have some reference to the, to the, to the bedroom itself. So I decided to print the ink on the cover with the same ink that you stick on the, the wall of the bedrooms, of the child's bedroom. So when you turn off the lights, you see it like this. So there's just a couple of examples of other stuff that I've done. Now I'm just going to give a very short uh, history of colours. Colours began 22 years ago when the Benetton's photographer Oliviero Toscani asked a designer called Tibor Kalman to make a new kind of magazine. And it was based on a very simple but powerful premise that in this new globalised world they saw around them that diversity was a good thing and the magazine would celebrate global culture. And a good example of this is issue number four, which is the race issue. And it was a monothematic magazine, so it just took one theme for each issue. And it used a very didactic visual language. It was also very playful. I mean, this was before kind of everybody knew what Photoshop was. I actually remember seeing this as a, as a kid on the six o'clock news. And it took on the big issues of the day. This is the AIDS issue. And it was very confrontational. In fact, um, Tibor said that he wanted to use the techniques of advertising and apply them to social issues. And it took on large elemental themes like religion, wealth, touch, multiculturalism, so when I first got the opportunity to direct an issue of the magazine, I had this equation in my mind. And the premise that the magazine is based on is, in the last 22 years, has become more true, not if anything. You know, we are even more globalized and even more interconnected. But I asked whether diversity is just a good thing. We're told that a website built in the... Middle East is responsible for a bomb going off in London. A mortgage that you get on your house in London is responsible for a bank in Greece defaulting on its debt. A car that you drive in Perugia is responsible for the ice melting in the Arctic. On, on the one hand, we are very aware of this huge interconnection in the world. And on the other, there's this feeling of very little human agency or ability to affect. And I didn't want to just show people the world anymore. So. I decided that it would take the form of guides, survival guides. And the first one was a guide to transport. Now, why transport? More than 90% of the way we move is dependent on a finite resource. And I, at the time, I was reading a lot of stuff around peak oil and... Um, you know, predictions of when the resource would run out. And I, did, and I thought it would be interesting to find people who are in the world today who are making their own forms of transport, often by virtue of circumstance. Sorry. And this is the content page. I'm just going to take you through a couple of stories. It begins with this quote from Henry Ford. Most people spend more time and energy going around problems than trying to solve them. How to build the next century. This is a plastic bottle. 1,500 of these are thrown away every second in the United States alone. This one was found on a beach in Kenya. 
by a guy called Mansell, and he did something with it. He built a boat. He built a boat with all of the debris and plastic bottles that he found on the beach, and he calls it the Century. And in the magazine, we show you how you can build your own. And it's really a way of telling the story and explaining his process. How to pick up arms against Gaddafi. This is an improvised control box. Each button on this control box fires two missiles. You'll find it in the front of a truck, a truck like this one. Um, this is Abdullah, a farmer, and him and many other farmers converted their pickup trucks into improvised tanks. And I had noticed them in the background to the news um, at the time and thought that it was a way of us talking about an oil-producing nation and um, also kind of picking out a particular element of design that was within the conflict as a way of having a, a, a way of exploring the story. And of course we show you how to build your own. And it also allowed us to talk about where the arms came from, the fact that lots of them come from the, so um, the Soviet Union and the relics of that time. How to burn fat fast. These are chips from a deep fat fryer in England. Now in the UK, the average chip shop produces about 20 litres of waste cooking oil every week. And Buzz Fisher from Wales made a car that runs on that chip fat. And we look at how you can use chip fat as, um, as fuel. You can even use human fat. There was a plastic surgeon in the States who actually made what he called lipodiesel out of his patient's excess fat. You can use coffee, you can use hemp, you can use peanuts, you can even use shit. Shit is an incredible resource. You can get methane gas from shit. And we'll talk more about that now. Shit was the next issue in the Survival Guide series. <laughs> Now, why shit? More children die from diarrhea, a banal stomach bug, to anyone who has a flushable toilet, than die from HIV AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. But it's not talked about. We talk about sanita sanitation problems and water issues. We don't have the language to tackle it, and it's one of the massively overlooked stories because it's continuous. This is uh, the contents page. This is a bed in Haiti for someone who has cholera. And when the cholera outbreak happened, it made front page news around the world. But diarrhea, which kills many, many more people every year, doesn't make the news because it's a continuous story. And from this, we go to explaining how feces moves from feet to fingers to food and actually how disease spreads. This shit is from an anonymous donor in New York, and it's going to be used in a process called fecal transplant. And it's simply where someone takes one person's shit, and with, by inserting it with a tube up the anus, they um, rebuild the flora in the gut. And it can actually save people's lives. And we show you how you can do it yourself. Be careful when doing this one. This is a plastic garden chair. After the earthquake in Christchurch, New Zealand, one like this was used to build an improvised toilet. Now, the whole sewage infrastructure had broken down, so people were resorting to having to build their own toilets. These pictures are actually taken by the residents. And we show you how you can build your own. So from shit to happiness. Happiness was the next issue in the Survival Guide series. <coughs> now happiness was a much more difficult subject to take on. It seemed interesting because I think particularly in the kind of recession time you have politicians talking about GNH opposed to GDP and um, it's it's Inherently, it's ethereal, you know, unlike transport and shit, which are very tangible. You know how to take on the issue. We're a highly visually based ma uh, magazine. Um, so I decided that we would look at it both from 
a psychological perspective, really what goes on inside your head and also in terms of neurology and really try and look at the science of happiness. How to fake a smile. This is Maddie. She's six years old and she's in a beauty pageant in Kentucky. And from this we look at how a smile works and how actually by forcing yourself to smile it releases serotonin in the brain. How, what smiles mean in different cultures. Now this man is praying. He's from a church in the United States who pray through laughter. And they, laughter is highly infectious and eventually the whole church erupts in laughter and they believe it makes them closer to God. It's one of the stories in the magazine. And from these stories we use them as jumping off points to look at actually what is happening neurologically inside the brain. How endorphins are released, how you can get more endorphins by doing certain things like eating the right food or scratching or different aspects around um, the issue. How to choose your therapist. This is Morisco. He's a llama. But he's also a therapist. He's used as an animal therapist in the States. And we look at other forms of animal therapy. By touching an animal, you actually lower the blood pressure in yourself and also the animal as well. Then we recommend other forms of therapy as well. From happiness to the end of the world, the apocalypse was the next issue in the series. And it seemed like a timely topic to take on because there was all this hysteria around 2012. And I wanted to look at this kind of the, the scientific consensus around global warming and climatic change and look at actually what the scientists are saying as, as being a real place. So this is the Mayan calendar which has been adapted to actually relate to different forms of climatic change, each quadrant, which is on the cover. And then we would go to a series of different places in the world which are undergoing, right now, the predictions of climatologists in the future and find people who could teach us things. This is in Montserrat, where after a volcano, so massive tectonic shifting, um, there's still people living there. And then we talk to the survivors and then also give survival advice how to deal with a volcano. We also look at desertification, techniques on how to breathe, what food to grow, how to cook, whether it's from the sun or using a car battery. And then we also talk to survival experts as well. This is Doug Hoffman, who's a survivalist, who teaches us how to hide. And so from the apocalypse to the market, the market was the next issue in the series, and it was a slight shift in, in gear in a way. It was looking at markets as a network of trade. It seemed like a timely topic because of the financial crisis. And the approach was to find local markets to explain larger economic ideas. And we begin um, where most textbooks say that the free market came to dominate the world, which is after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that the satellite technology that was developed by the Americans to spy on the Soviets in the Cold War is now used by stock market traders to look at supermarket parking lots and crop yields for the, for, so they can predict the, the stock market movements. This is the mercantile stock exchange, which is actually the la one of the last open outcry trading floors. There used to be 10,000 people working there. Today, there's only 1,000. And from there, we go to a story about how automated algorithms now dominate the way in which we trade. And then I wanted to, uh, maybe it's because I'm unable to truly un grasp economics, but I often find that these graphs seem very removed from reality, but they have this relationship which isn't obvious. This is, a gra this is what happened to the stock market after the death of Osama bin Laden. And we try and look at the abstract rendering of reality from the stock markets and twin it with real world events like politicians resigning, the weather, football. And from this computer, we, we went to 
Nigeria, just outside um, Lagos, um, to see where that computer might end up. And within this story, we also explore looking at, looking at planned obsolescence within, within the way that we design things. Then we went to see Julius, who takes these computers and he salvages them and he gives them another economic cycle. This is Alaba Market. And we also went to look at how the trade in counterfeited goods is in Alaba. And it's a very different attitude towards copyright um, there. In fact, these CDs were considered fakes and they decided the production house that they wanted to get money from the, the sellers, so they declared them legal or real. And all of these pictures of the Mona Lisa are fake, apart from one. they most likely been painted here in Defen in China, where half of the world's commercial oil paintings come from. And the magazine carries on in this fashion of these causal relationships and kind of goes on a journey. Um, so there's a very quick overview of some of the recent issues. Now I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about um, making the news, which is the most recent one, which we're launching here today. And um, I suppose here we were trying to do something different. We were trying to take a step back from the actual process of news making and look at how news has changed, the implications of new technology, and look at what, how the news cycle distorts, whether that's through the speed of communication now or just inherent human bias. This is a randomly selected page of the Daily Mail where all articles derived from press releases have been removed. And 60% of articles in the UK are wholly or, or, or partly or wholly derived from press releases. This has always been part of the way news gets made. It's just exponentially grown. And from there we, we look at the pressures on the industry. How many people have been made redundant due to a new economic model that people are struggling to adapt to? The, Amer the American newspaper industry has shrunk by half in the last decade. These pictures are from the Inquirer, the Philadelphia Inquirer, which is our case study of a, a newspaper undergoing these pressures. From here, we look at how the 24-hour news cycle and the advent of all these new technologies have created a compound, compound problem. So you have less people expected to do more in the same amount of time. And then we talk to people at the Philadelphia Inquirer and also look at how the Philadelphia Inquirer used to have foreign bureaus across the world. Today they have none. No one knows how many civilians have been killed in Wazaristan, Pakistan. And journalists aren't actually allowed into um, this part of Pakistan. And here we're looking at somebody who's filling that gap that's been created. Um, these pictures are from Noor Buram, who um, he hears when drone strikes have happened on the radio, and then he goes to the sites and he actually um, looks for evidence. This guy is holding a fragment of a missile. And he'll go through the debris with different people and this is an ID card. This man's body was blown to pieces. And the, the, the figures on how many people have been killed through drone strikes is bitterly contested. So actually um, finding evidence of someone's death is very important. Oh. And then um, we also have this other layer within the magazine where we try and explain the process in these comics. So how Noor works how he hears about the drone strike, how he gets there, how he collates the information. Another way people are trying to report on something which is very difficult to report is through an application called Dronestagram, where they get information from um, which is put online and then use a uh, Google map to find the places where the drone strike happens. Drone technology has also been used by paparazzi, this was used to take pictures of Paris Hilton on the French Riviera. 
This is the guy who flies it. In 2007, model Anna Nicole Smith's death received 10 times more coverage than the US, in the USA than the ICCP report that confirmed global warming. Oh. And in the article that, we, that goes with this, we look at how celebrity news, which is far bigger than all other news, is going under this, the same kind of pressures that, tr the, the, that hard news is. There were, actually, when Britney Spears had, when she shaved her head, she had 50 journalists following her. And the majority of them were completely untrained with their cameras just set on automatic. So it was just important people being there to get the picture, not having the professional. These pictures are of 15-year-old Fabian Charisma, who was shot dead by police after looting three plastic chairs. Now, two of these pictures won awards, and they made newspapers around the world. And then some time afterwards, this picture came out. And there was this outcry, and the journalists were accused of being vultures. And I think this is interesting because there's this... We're uncomfortable seeing the process of how news really gets made. This is part of the reality of news making, but we don't actually like to see it. We find it very distasteful. Oh. And we go to Israel, which probably has the highest concentration of journalists per capita anywhere in the world. And it's almost a bad place to go to, to, to look at um, impartiality, because everything is so complex and so bitterly contested. It's very difficult to come out of things with a clear conclusion, um, because there's so much noise around it and such high emotion. Um, and it's also a training ground for journalists. They call them crocodiles. It's where people go to cut their teeth as a young journalist. But this picture was taken by a young journalist, and it was actually published in The Guardian. And it seems so clear that this guy is hitting these, these children in the car. And an Israeli pressure group actually you know, tried to t challenge the validity of the picture. They, uh, they accused the guy of... Um, paying the children to go in front of the car and said that it had all been staged. Um, I mean, the reality is, I think, that the children were just throwing rocks at the car, as they do as Israeli people would drive through. Um, and the same photographer claims to have taken tens of thousands of pictures like this. And we simply aggregated pictures. And you realize that we have a vernacular way that we report on certain things. We expect a certain kind of image. Does a picture of a boy throwing a rock in Palestine give us anything new or tell us anything about what's happening in the situation? On November the 14th, 2012, Israel declared war on Gaza by tweet. And actually Hamas retweeted and simultaneously while the conflict was happening there was also a Twitter war. This poster claims that the internet will give you cancer. It's a Haredi wall poster and due to religious doctrine and rules people can't publish certain things in the newspapers. So there's been for the last 100 years, actually, a practice of, of, of people venting their frustrations or things that they like to say on wall posters. This is a picture, which probably some of you have seen, of four missiles being tested in, um, in Iran. And it got released, very quickly disseminated in, in the way things do now, and it made front page news. And very shortly after, this picture came out, which showed that one of the missiles had been photoshopped. But it was too late, because the information was already out there. A slightly less sophisticated form of image manipulation, also from Iran. These, this is a Dutch newspaper after it's gone through the hands of Iranian censors. This is a Burmese newspaper. Until 2010, Burmese newspapers were not allowed to print the word censored. And you can see the level of 
of, of work that goes into kind of actually taking bits out and re-editing. And unlike the manipulation of pictures, which is very crude in some ways, you're very aware when a picture is manipulated. Words are much more subtle because it's not visible, the actual process of manipulation itself. And since 2010, due to the laxing of censorship laws, Burma is one of the places which is bucking the trend and actually has a growing newspaper industry. Here we go to, we went to TG Quattro, and for more than 20 years, Silvio Berlusconi has been buying the rights to all unflattering pictures of himself. And we look at how commercial pressures and ownership affect newsmaking. In fact, in the election in 2013, his, this program um, had three times more coverage of Berlusconi than any of his competitors. And this is just something I just want to explain about the physicality of the magazine because I think it has a conceptual relevance which is within the magazine you have these small books which allow you to see another perspective on the story. So they're kind of internally in the pages. So you see this picture that was used every time Berlusconi would talk um, generically. Um, and then you open it up and you see it within someone's living room. Then you see it within living rooms across the country. Pino Magnacci publicly broadcast his investigation into the Sicilian Mafia. He also owns his own television channel. It's family run and he has about 150,000 viewers. And again, we do this process diagram where we show you his working methodology. Al-Qaeda's media production house produces a new video once every three days. Now, Al-Qaeda, as much as being a terrorist organization, they're a media operation. They're actually very sophisticated. And we show you how a drop-off works, how they get the information out there from being in hiding. Look at the different presenters that Al-Qaeda have. And what's interesting is they have tried to ape and copy the, the style of traditional media to give legitimacy to their reports. This picture was published on an Islamic website um, and it's of an American a soldier being held hostage. And it turned out to be this plastic doll. And I suppose this is an illustration of how the, the speed of communication allows people to lie much more easily and things to just not to be verified. This is, this is a picture of um, journalists fleeing a shelling in Libya. And within the same second, this picture was taken. This picture won first prize in World Press Photo. This picture has barely ever been published again. And I suppose which one is a truer representation of the situation and what was happening within that moment? This picture is a picture of a picture. It was taken off the back of a camera of... Um, one of the rebels after they'd caught the um, Gaddafi. And this picture of a picture made front page news around the world. And in North Korea, people found out about Gaddafi's death from leaflets that were held in balloons that would be flown from South Korea to North Korea. This is the contents of one of those balloons. It has a, a piece of propaganda which says to the North Koreans, um, tells them about the deposed leaders during the Arab Spring and kind of encourages them to do the same thing. And it's actually funded by the Americans largely and not particularly liked by the South Koreans or the North Koreans. This is a picture of Kim Jong-un looking at South Korea. And in this article we look at the theatre of, of, of politics and how pol polit politicians have to pay, behave and fall into a certain vernacular of um, press imagery. And here you have the leader of the free world and the leader of one of the most oppressive regimes in the world doing the same things. Almost the same things, not exactly. And then of course we go to Putin, who has tranquilized tigers, recovered ancient artifacts from the sea, and flown with wild cranes. Now, when this protest happened, 
Russian state television claimed that only 7,000 people turned up. This activist counted 26,000. And this is a way people bypass the mainstream media. It's actually live streamed the protest directly as to an online channel. And from there we go to pamphlets that were found in Tahrir Square. Um, and during the protests, I think what's interesting is that we... The Arab Spring is known for kind of the advancing of Twitter and social media, but people also went back to something very primary. In fact, and and they, got, they, they, they passed information around in a very kind of basic way as well, and kind of gave people strategies. In fact, this um, piece of paper is advertising social media classes. And after Mubarak was overthrown, state television wouldn't show what had happened in a lot of the conflict. So this is Tahrir Screenings, which is a cinema which was set up in Tahrir Square, where people can see things that won't be shown on the television. In fact, in a protest, this became very famous, this incident with a girl wearing a blue bra and being beaten very savagely by police. And then it incited a process and became a symbol. This is actually from one of the protesters' um, uh, billboards. And in Bangladesh, rickshaws, which normally announce the day's cinema um, screenings, were used to warn people of an impending cyclone. And we go to something which is a very basic form of news, and actually just people you know, getting information out there. They actually saved thousands of people's lives. This is a picture of a tsunami hitting Japan. And after the tsunami hit, the infrastructure had gone in the country. So a hundred of these newspapers were produced, giving people vital information for six days after the tsunami. In fact, radio, which is still the most, reaches the most amount of people, despite all of these new forms of communication, um, this one was built by a 16-year-old in Sierra Leone who set up his own news uh, station. These are charging points. Most people don't have electricity in their homes in Sierra Leone, so they have to go to like, depots to actually get mobile phone charging. This is Patrick Maha, who, along with 37 other citizen journalists, monitored the 2012 elections and they would use it but with, with their, their mobile phones. And a lot of them had been disabled in the last elections, and quite brutally um, so. Patrick had his arms chopped off. Um, and he would go to polling stations and text to a Gmail account in London, which then would be uploaded on Tumblrs and Twitter and Facebook. And it was a way of people monitoring the elections to see if they were free and fair. This silicon baby was used by an undercover reporter called Anis, who used it in a sting operation to entrap... Uh, um, sorry, I'm used to having the prompts. <laughs> um, entrap in, in, in uh, witch doctors who murder babies. And he's a watchdog journalist. He says that he names, shames and jails, so he's really a man on a mission. And he does this very extreme form of, of, of undercover reporting he, uh, this is him dressed as a homeless man who is mentally ill, and he actually got himself sectioned to film um, the behavior of um, how the mental institution was actually treating its patients. This is him dressed as a rock on the border between Ghana and Ivory Coast, watching for cocoa smugglers. And something that just puts things into perspective is you're more likely as a journalist to be killed for writing something that somebody doesn't like than you are from going to war. This picture is from a blog called El Blog del Narco. Um, due to the fact it's so dangerous to report on what's happening in Mexico with the, with the crime and the, and the syndicates, there was actually an editorial in the front of this newspaper that asked the cartels what they wanted the newspaper to write. And it's led, into, led to this anonymous 
Lee, uh, like supplied blog which reports on murder reports in um, Mexico. And it's followed by news of organizations around the world. And I suppose we exist in a different situation now. You can get the raw information that becomes news very easily. It's become democratized. And I think we're not going to get the scoop anymore. But what newsmakers should do is contextualize and find a way that packages the news. And then we, at the back, we come clean and show you the crops uh, that we've used within the magazine. And you also get a newspaper giving you more practical advice on being a journalist, which you may recognize from the cover. So there's a kind of a top-level look of the recent issues. I'm just going to talk very briefly about my approach. We visualize the issue. It's not enough to just have a story which is, is interesting in terms of an interview. We're a visual, visually based magazine, so we actually have to see what we're talking about as well, which is a kind of a process of filtering, which is slightly different to other publications. We objectify. We use a very formal language. We use the typological method, so we can see the similarities between things and also the differences. We look at things often, opposed to the cliched reportage image. This is actually a banknote that after the overthrowing of Mobutu, they couldn't afford to reprint the currency, so they simply hole-punched his face out of the banknote. And I think it almost says more, this object, than the classic reportage image. We deconstruct things down to their component parts. We show you how things work, literally say how something moves around the body. This is a cow being smuggled in a tunnel um, from Egypt into Gaza. We show process, so something that accompanies the picture which contextualizes how things happen. These guys are doing laughing yoga. And of course, as we're a guide, we explain how to. Something else that I think is very important is that we celebrate human ingenuity. We're often looking at people who are in difficult situations, who are doing things which are quite extraordinary. And there's actually often things that you can learn from them. So by virtue of circumstance, they're doing something which we can learn from. And beyond the magazine itself, we also try and see how we can build out from it and actually make it tangible. In this case, um, we interpreted the cover as road signs. This was for an exhibition at the Design Museum. And for making the news, we decided to go one step further and use this image as an inspirational starting point for the machine which you'll be able to go to at Perugia. Um, and a designer at Fabrica, in fact, Jonathan, who's here, um, developed a machine which was based on this illustration I am the news machine tweet on the ad colors machine my megaphone will read your news out loud half of all news stories published in Switzerland Italy and the United States contain factual errors. The tape recorder listens, converting what it hears into text, so that the television can show it on screen. The camera watching the television converts what it sees into a signal to the radio antenna, which broadcasts the tweet. Half of all the new stories rubbished in Swaziland, Sicily and the Nut States contain feudal arrows. A waiting microphone interprets the radio address as text again, and then I'll print it. Compare the original tweet with my final report.
Accuracy of reproduction varies according to the clarity of your writing and to chance. Is there any questions? Yep. I think somebody is. Marina Lalovic, Babel TV, Sky. So uh, I'm going to read your initial claim. All cultures have the same value. This is like the init uh, initial value of Colors magazine from 1991. How this claim changed through times and do you still follow this claim? I mean, I think it takes, you know, I feel that it takes a humanistic set of values that underpin um, the approach to colors. I think the only thing that I would add to that is that you, you, you need to also have a dose of reality and not fall into to kind of moral relativism. So I think it is important to value things in this very universal way, but not to try and to the, to the degree that you try and sugarcoat situations and give or skew things to make everything positive. That's what I would say. So how was the evolution of this concept of multiculturalism into interculturalism, for instance? So how did how this concept evolved through the years? Uh, you know, you, you started with the race issue and everything. So how this, does it also represent today a leitmotiv of the magazine and everything? Sorry? The, does it uh, represent uh, still a leitmotiv like the... The, the focus and the base of the magazine. Like the colors is very uh, tangible, as you said, you know, like a uh, name and everything, it, it follows is the magazine and everything. So how, how this um, interculturalism, multiculturalism follows uh, this, uh, this magazine? And does it still follow? I think the spirit of that still is there. I think it hopefully is a bit more subtle and the articles are slightly longer, so they go into more depth, and that it gives a bit more context. I mean, I love the old ones. I remember seeing them when I was a student, and there was something that was very new, and it was not like other publications. And I think the kind of the context that Colours exists in is very different. There are many more publications trying to do the same kind of thing. So I think it's about recognising what we can do and do well and kind of um, I think it may be slightly less poppy I think thank you I'm Marta Brachini from Radio Radicale um, uh, I'm, I apologize but I don't understand basically if your magazine is about news or making news I mean, uh, you, you said before that uh, your method is uh, to contextualize then, uh, the packaging of the news. Is the packaging more important than the news in this uh, era of uh, Web uh, 2.0? I think it's not more important, no. But I think that it's something which is often missed in the process of newsmaking. I don't think I'm a journalist. You know, my background isn't from journalism. And I, um, but I do think it's important to actually look how the machine works, which I think is done in a very superficial way. You kind of, you do get the shot at the end of the news report where you'll see the room or kind of the thing of the, the, the journalist running around or the CNN moment of a citizen journalist, which is very celebrated now. But I don't actually think we properly look at the mechanics of the process. Um, and that's one part of it. It's not the whole of the magazine. It's just an aspect that I think is, is uh, important to look at. What's your mission? I don't think I have a mission exactly, because I think it would be a bad premise. Um, 
I think it's a starting point, and then you see where it takes you. Okay, thank you. Ginko Kobayashi for Yahoo Japan. Thank you very much for your lovely presentation. But uh, I just wondered, could you explain the funding of your magazine and who buys your magazine? How many people buy your magazine? Um, it's funded by Benetton. Um, and I think that is something which is an irony in a way because Colors is completely independent. And I think that there's this kind of paradox in the fact that you have news organizations um, which are often beholden to different advertising, you know, different advertisers, and they have to be quite careful about what they say. Um, we, are, we have one funder. We have someone which is the, uh, Benetton. And um, it's based on essentially a set of values, which is done on a very trust-like basis that it's gone into the magazine, I think. Um, and in terms of, we have circulation, we, we're always in two languages. So we have English, Italian, English, French, English, Spanish, English, Korean, English, Chinese, and English, Portuguese. And I don't have the exact figures on the, on the, the figures for buying, sorry. Good morning. Uh, I do apologize in advance because I don't know if I, if I will be able to structure the question in the right way. But um, I vividly remember that in 1995, I think, um, Larry Clark filmed uh, some frames of, of the film, of the movie Kids, um, in which the, the two main characters walking uh, in front of, um, of some newspapers through which colors um, was emphasized somehow, and you, and you could assist at them. It was a sort of, I think, a sort of quotish, uh, uh, of quotation, uh, um, a, a citation of an artist from another, from another artist. Nonetheless, uh, during the years, I found on, in, inside the numbers of, of callers a lot of real news um, which were a lot more news that other news in, in the normal newspapers. In, in the sense of the, in, in the journalistic sense, uh, which probably the colleagues uh, were, were first talking about. So, how, how much do you think, uh, do you think that, for instance, that stuff that you first um, proje project on the screen, visualized issue, was uh, in some kind, the car, the Chinese car, a sort of, um, I don't know, Fahrenheit uh, of Truffaut? of the Truffaut director, our director, was a, a sort of piece of a, of a movie. Uh, so how much do you think that your mm, journal is art and how much is news? And why don't, why don't you think that the hugely number of news inside of it, and uh, allow me the terms, surprisingly news, uh, because they are they they make you they makes you they make you, ref, they make you reflect, they make you think more much more than normal news. Why don't you think that the, the, your newspaper can become a real newspaper news? Because there is too much art, because there is too much um, uh, artistic issues that people normally cannot understand as real news. Is, is the packaging covering somehow the real news? Is that, that's very strange because in, it, it's an incredible, in a, in a visualized era, as our era is, your way should be the most easily to, to vehicle a news. Instead, paradoxically, is less considered, I don't know, compared to New York Times or whatever. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry if I no, didn't it's okay. explain no, I'm myself. I'm trying to pull the, get uh, my to grips with the question. I mean, I'm happy if people call it news. I'm not, you know, I don't mean to kind of categorize it and say that what we do is this, you know. I just think that what's important is to, you know, it's a very fortunate kind of like, it, there's a great idea behind it essentially that you take one issue and you go into it in depth and that can take you in many different directions and it's really, it is, it's looking at 
It is a form of news, but it's looking at the larger ideas that shape our world in a way which is kind of accessible. And I think that is important within the approach of colours. Um, but I don't mind if it's called news or whether it's called art. I don't know. I, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you, everybody. And go and see the machine. Thanks. <laughs>